either has had a baby or is about to momentarily. So, oh, you can see. Yeah, so he's, he's at home <coughs> doing those, the important thing of being a dad, a new dad. Um, so, uh, welcome. Thank you for being here. Really appreciate it. Um, to start with, I just want to talk a little bit about committee processes. Uh, and also apologize about the documents I sent to all of you that many of you could not open. I, I apologize. Somebody will have to tell me what I did there, but next time we will not have that happen. Um, let's see. In terms of processes, uh, we just heard from our uh, lawyer, and we are going to have to, we do have to follow, the committee does, uh, the open meetings act of the state, which means uh, we can't be deliberating outside of meetings. Not that we're exactly making decisions, we're not going to be determining policy or anything like that. Any kind of policy decisions will be going to the board, we're, we're an information gathering committee. Nonetheless, we do have to follow the Sunshine Law. Um, I don't think it's going to be a big issue for the group. What that means is um, you can't be sending emails out to the entire group. We can't have conversations of, we have 16 people on this committee. It's a large committee. Uh, not more than seven can be communicating about a particular issue outside of meetings. You can't have a majority of the committee talking to each other outside of meetings. I don't think this is, like I said, going to be that difficult. I see that likely working together at least initially is probably the users are going to be working together on their pieces of work and the um, the building systems experts I'm seeing are likely primarily in this first month going to be working in teams so um, I don't think there's going to be any danger that we're going to be having too many people together all at once um, but it's just something to keep in mind I, I uh, handed out the information that came from David Lamp, he's our lawyer, and if you have any questions, um, you know, we can discuss them at the next meeting. But the biggest problem usually is sending an email out to everybody and then everybody responding, you know, this interaction between everybody happening by email. That's the, the one place where a committee, you know, there's kind of a danger of that happening. So just, just be conscious not to do that. Um, and like I said, if you have any questions, just, just let us know. Let Dorothy and I know. Um, I also wanted to just say that we want to make sure everybody has an opportunity to participate in discussions. So I just ask that um, people be cognizant if they've talked already. You know, gather your thoughts. Um, let's, you know, we don't want anybody dominating the discussion. We want everybody to be able to participate. So just to keep that in mind. Uh, first thing to do, a lot of people do not know each other in this room, I believe, so we're just going to go around the room, introduce yourself, and why you think you got asked to be on the committee. Uh, you know, your work, you know exactly what you're doing here. So, let's start with David. Oh, and just to let you know, as you see, there's a camera here, um, and a camera crew, <laughs> volunteers. Uh, from, uh, we have Channel 5 uh, camera. Uh, Channel 5 is going to, you know, put our discussions on Channel 5 so the public can see it. And they're going to be bringing a memory stick uh, to Terry to the office so that it can be put up on our website. Because there's going to be a lot of interest, I think, in these discussions. We want to make sure the public has, you know, is able to kind of follow what the dis how the discussions are. Uh, so, okay, so go ahead, uh, David. David Roach, I suppose I got here because I started the whole discussion on maintenance in the schools a couple of years ago. And it sort of followed on from there. And whatever I can do to help, I'll be happy to do so. And why don't you say what you do? So I've got a home inspection and commercial inspection and property inspection company. So um, looking at buildings all the time today, I did a car dealership. And every building's a little bit different, but they all basically run the same. They all have heating and cooling, plumbing, electrical, walls and roofs. And um, that's what we're dealing with here, basic, basic components. Kenneth Sanford, uh, sixth grade teacher here at Mills Long. 
Brian Mayer, um, 5 through 12 instrumental music. Uh, I'm in my ninth year here, and I was a student here, K through 12. Um, graduated in 03, and uh, Mr. Hatter asked me to be on here as a user and resident of the town. Jerry Papania, I'm a retired civil engineer. I spent my 50 year career designing industrial facilities. Um, and uh, I hope to uh, contribute to the process of coming up with a facilities plan that meets the needs of all the, all the stakeholders and uh, especially the taxpayers of the district. I'm Craig Conrad. I was maintenance supervisor here for 27 years before Craig Carter took over. So I guess I know a little bit about the buildings. I'm Mike Slaughter. I'm an electrical engineer, primarily in the semiconductor industry. I went to school here in Yellow Springs and grew up here. I attended fifth grade in this building, and John Bryan and was in middle school and through the high school. Uh, I hope to contribute uh, in whatever it takes to uh, whatever facilities we have in shape. And I'm Judith Hempling. Uh, I'm on the school board. Uh, my children uh, both went to Yellow Springs schools. And two of my grandchildren are now here in Oslo. Dory Pibouquet, I'm a member of the school board as well. I have a child in second grade in this building and another one that might come up in a couple of years here. <laughs> I'm Scott Fife. I'm uh, retired from Centerville Schools. I was the director of information technology most recently. Uh, worked 40 years in education as a teacher and administrator. And the only uh, building system in which I claim any expertise is, is the IT infrastructure. Uh, but I do have experience with the permanent improvement plan and the permanent improvement levy funding, which we used in my previous employment to uh, conduct a large scale, long term building improvement, enhancement, addition, renovation process similar to what may be envisioned here. I'm Chris Hamilton. I'm a parent. I've got a, uh, a junior, a freshman, and a seventh grader in schools here. They've been in school here for nine years. Uh, I was part of the facilities task force uh, two years ago. Um, I'm a program manager, engineer, uh, retired Air Force, and I've led some programs and, and diving into requirements is kind of a thing that I do for work. Thanks. My name is Mike Richley. I'm an architect with uh, Richley Architects out of Dayton. And I think if it's okay, I'll hold my comments till we talk about my role later on in the agenda. Okay. Terry Golden, Superintendent. Um, Megan Winston, Principal of Mills Lawn, and this is my 12th year in K-12 um, education. And I am sure that I was asked to be here because one of my um, important responsibilities is to make sure that um, the teachers and the staff members and the students have um, an environment that is conducive to learning and safe for learning. Um, and that's my responsibility, so I'm sure that's why I'm here. Okay, thanks. Um, okay, so um, we sent, I sent out the, or Dorothy and I have, you know, put this proposal together. We put it in front of the school board, the school board it is a living document, things could change some, but basically it's laying out the work of the committee. Um, and so uh, basically the idea is that in order to know uh, what a permanent improvement plan would look like for this community, we actually have to develop one. It will be a combination of a maintenance plan uh, as well as you know deeper renovations we're assuming there will be also the need for deeper renovations and new construction to meet the needs, you know, of our of our schools at this time. Um, this, just to know, this committee is going to be information gathering. We're not making a decision about what we're going to do. We're going to be handing that information to the community and to the school board and uh, be discussing it, and I'm sure the staff will be involved as well, um, in terms of thinking about what is the best uh, direction for us to go in terms of meeting our facility needs. So 
uh, we're going to try to give as clear pictures what it would take to um, develop, to have a permanent improvement plan that would be maintaining our buildings in good, good to excellent condition, um, and then what sort of additional uh, facilities do we need to be able to meet the needs of the students and the staff. Uh, did you want to say anything no, to that? Okay. Uh, to start out, um, is there any questions about the proposal? Can I ask, uh, was everyone able to access the document that you did send? Okay. I want to make sure that this one was accessible. Okay. Okay. Um, and if questions come as we go along, you know, again, let's try to be comfortable with each other and, uh, you know, be open, you know, be an open place where people can ask the questions that they have and get the answers that they need. Uh, okay, so the first thing, um, the thing that we're working on now, we're not quite, do not quite have it ready to share with you, is a documents depository. Um, uh, Terry shared with us all the documents that have been developed over the last how many years five years probably five six seven years um, regarding facility needs and kind of plans for facility meeting facility needs uh, it's quite a a bunch of documents it's an overwhelming number of documents and so dorothy and i um, but there's a lot of good information there. Dorothy and I, and actually Scott helped to, actually Scott has done most of the work thus far in trying to go through those documents and, and identify the documents that really speak about the condition of our facilities uh, as the current uh, facilities. And we're trying to pull those out and put them in a, in a separate place in the depository that you all will be able to access. Um, also information about users and what they've identified as needs facility needs. So we're in process of separating that out so you don't have to wade through, you know, what are many, many documents, um, and you can kind of find what you need, uh, the information that you need to be able to, you know, play, to be able to be as informed as possible. The kind of documents that are going to be in there is the OFCC report, the Fan Power report, um, user questionnaires uh, that may be in there in those sorts of documents. Um, Dorothy is kind of taking responsibility because she understands how to do these things, of separating these documents out. And Scott has already gone through uh, some of the documents, and so they're going to tell you a few minutes about what, what's there. Yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm going to start, Scott, and then Please I'll hand it to you. Um, so it will be a drive on Google. We'll send, it, we'll send it by email maybe during this meeting. You'll see that there are folders uh, in there that dates back, with documents dating back to 2017. I've kept it as uh, Dr. Holden handed it to us, organized like this. We're just going to add 2022 folders, and then we're going to compile all of the documents that we think are relevant for the conditions of um, of the buildings. Uh, in, in addition, you'll find the minutes uh, of this meeting that I'm typing as we go around. In the future, our treasurer will be doing the minutes keeping, but for today, I'll do it. And then because there was a, an overwhelming amount of documents, uh, Scott started a process of creating an interactive table so that we see we can have a snapshot of what documents pertains to what, and that will be also included in the drive that you'll have. And I'll let, let you take a look. You want to talk about the interactive table or? You've actually done a pretty good job of it. It's, All right. I exported the directory structure and put it into a spreadsheet so that you'll be able to see every document and the folder it's in. And if we do some classifying of them to try and get you more direct access to the documents that pertain to the, the tasks that the committee has given, the hope would be that we speeded things up a little when we're not spending a lot of time trying to find stuff. Exactly. And and so far Scott has covered half of the documents that are classified and organized. We have to do the second half. So in a matter of days that will be done. And um, yeah, when you give me the go ahead I will share this uh, I will send the invitation to all the members here of this of this book. Yeah and we're thinking we'll have it ready by well I'm thinking maybe by early next week for sure so that you'll be able to access, access those. Um, the next thing um, 
we wanted to talk a little bit about is what is a permanent improvement plan and hearing from people who have uh, you know, basically seen them and how they work. And I asked Scott and Mike to speak briefly to this. Whoever you want to go first. I think that's let Mike do that. Okay. Um, I'll share briefly. So a permanent improvement plan or a maintenance plan would be um, approaching your facilities with, with um, say, a, a slightly different lens than they've been approached in either the, the 1.0 or the 2.0 version. And this would be to look at the condition of facilities, understand um, what needs replaced and when, and to put it on uh, a concept like cycle cost or a, a projection cost of I have X number of air handlers that are need to be replaced in X number of years and uh, or different side like maybe I don't need to replace all the roof but I need to replace certain sections of the roof and here's how they're going to be prioritized uh, over time. So it's a way, it's essentially a way of looking at maintaining your facilities um, and putting dollars associated with those tasks in a timeline. I also think what's important in this process is to you know, look at cost and, and what would uh, a permanent improvement millage of two mills, three mills, four mills, five mills bring in on your, your, your basis and what might that afford? And do we have enough money rolling in to really make a meaningful bite out of the repairs that need to be done? So it's kind of taken a, at least in my view, a holistic look at what money is available to come in, what needs to be repaired, and, and on, on kind of what timeline. Now the expert. <laughs> but please, I, I, I don't claim to be an expert about this other than that I, I, I guess if I have two cents worth to add to this, it would be that I think a permanent improvement plan is something that exists completely independently of the problem of what we do about the school facilities and building new or renovating and so forth. It's, it's something that you just ought to do. You know long-term plan for your facilities, making sure that, you know, everything's got a life cycle and making sure you know what that is and you're prepared for it and that you've got a budget to, to handle that. Uh, uh, I bet Dr. Holden will not be surprised to hear that, you know, schools are amongst the worst offenders in terms of you plan budgets and you set, you set targets and you work out figures and then the state comes along and cuts the amount of money that you get and all that goes right out the window and you're dealing with, you know, uh, emergency situations and you're trying to cover as best you can. And I know that happens in every single school district in this state, not just Yellow Springs. Um, uh, but that's, you know, that's really all I have to say about that. I, it's a great idea. I think we should do it regardless of how we choose to solve the building needs, um, but best laid plans. Yeah, thank you. Um, so we were going to talk about uh, one thing that uh, Mike, uh, our architect, has suggested is, um, I mean, an architect helps thinking about deep renovations and new construction but they don't do maintenance plans. And so uh, Mike has recommended that we hire a maintenance plan advisor. Uh, these are engineering firms that, stay in, that help schools to develop. Um, I mean, some schools may have uh, the staff to be able to actually do this themselves. And I think to some extent that is what Centerville did. Um, I mean, they did not hire a maintenance plan advisor. They've got a facilities manager who's a full-time staff member because they've got 13, 14 buildings they are taking care of. But um, so we're looking at um, look at a maintenance plan advisor that we're uh, Terry and our uh, treasurer and our lawyer are developing a request for qualifications to hire a maintenance plan advisor that will help us look at the needs of our buildings and okay so now what are we going to do with it and how we put that all together and, and up against the, the funding that it will take to do that and on a schedule you know on a calendar of that over time aspect to it so um mike is also going you know has worked basically in schools i think all of his 
almost all of his professional life, and um, he's had a lot of experience. So he's going to be here, you know, to advise us to things that we're missing, uh, things that we need to be considering. Um, and I wanted to give him a minute to talk a little bit about um, how he's, you know, feels that he can really help the committee to do its work. Sure. Thank you for the opportunity to be here and hopefully help out. A little bit on my background, I was uh, hired in 2016 by the Yale Spring School Board um, to, to uh, look at the first 1.0 version of the facilities master plan. There was a lot of planning in 2017 that went into the May of 2018 bond issue. This at that time was the addition and renovation to the high school. So I was uh, worked with Mario to help author and, and create that plan. Of course, we all know what happened to version 1.0. Uh, so Mario had asked uh, me to sit on a facilities advisory committee in 2019, which I did uh, most of that year into early 2020, where a lot of these similar conversations happened, a certain amount of these conversations were happening. Um, uh, hopefully I helped that process just to uh, provide insight or input or context or um, uh, kind of direction to, to where the committee was going. Where I think I could hopefully help in this process is I think there's going to be things a maintenance plan advisor may not be best suited to do. Like, for example, if the committee decides it's not advantageous to maintain the modulars at the high school. Uh, and so instead, maybe we should look at a new construction component of this plan. How big is it? Where does it go? What is it? How do we budget for it? Um, if we want to look at things like um, improving secure entry vestibules or, or any kind of uh, building uh, design stuff around security, if we want to look at band rooms, any of these kind of one-offs, I think I could help provide some expertise on the planning and the costing side of that. That would just help what the, I think the maintenance plan advisor is going to be looking at kind of maintaining yeah, sure. system yeah, facilities, but not necessarily the students can do plans that we come up with will impact the status of the facility with the building code. I know when you reach a certain level of modification that the new building code kicks in. Uh, do you have any comments on that? Um, yeah, sure, yes I do. So the question is always like how deep do you go and what does that trigger? Um, for example, um, the, the storm shelter moratorium is up in fall of 2022. So any district that should be planning future projects, this would likely not be funded before fall of 2022, would uh, theoretically be outside of this. So now we're inside the storm shelter requirement. What triggers that? Does a renovation trigger that? What size of renovation triggers it? If you do a major renovation to a building, does that mean we need to consider a storm shelter and um, maybe we need to check in with Green County's jurisdiction and authority and see if they, that, that's a big deal to a renovation project. How you would house the entire student body in a 150 mile wind event um, is, is pretty major. So I can help in, in, in some of those areas. I think some of them we're gonna have to feel out together and see where it goes. Are there any additional ones on top of the storm shelter that um, you should be aware of? Another big one's like fire alarm. What triggers a full building fire alarm upgrade? And if you do it, you have to do the whole building. And, um, there, there are certain uh, kind of slippery slopes from a code perspective that can happen. And I'm here, I, uh, I'm here to help. If I don't know the answer, I can make a few calls generally and get to an answer pretty quickly. Uh, fire alarm is one of those things that we've, we've run into on, on these projects where let's say you're doing a small addition or just focusing on a certain area, but you're required to bring the entire building up uh, to the voice enunciated uh, fire alarm code so you can do the voice override and, and, and talk on the system. Those are current code requirements. That can be a big deal because you know, like I'm just looking over here, but all of a sudden now I've triggered a whole building uh, upgrade of a, of a particular system. Does that include the sprinkler system too? Well, that's, that's, that would be another one. That, that would be another one, and they're usually kind of linked. Uh, sometimes some of these systems are linked together because, like, well, if I'm getting down, if I'm going down the corridors anyway, 
to do a certain amount of work, what other systems might be logical to consider at the same time. Uh, but we're not looking at a change of use, so we're you know we're not changing <coughs> from um, so we're not really required to do a full building upgrade. But sometimes certain things can trigger certain things, and I'm sure you, Mr. Roach, knows a lot about about that. Can I ask a question about looking at a change of use? Uh, I'm thinking we, we know that we have modern systems and trailers in the back that we would consider uh, switching to a permanent solution. Is that considered to be a change of use? No. Okay. What would be a change of use is if you went into a commercial building and turned it into a school. That would be a change of use where you'd be required to bring the entire project up to, up to code at that time. But since you're already in educational use occupying this building and the site, you're not changing, you're, you're, as you're making modifications to it, you're not changing its use. Okay. Okay. Um, so what we're imagining is that the members of the committee will be doing work between the meetings. Um, and we've identified sort of assignments, you'll see, for the building users and assignments for the building system experts. <coughs> So why don't we look at those a little bit. Uh, the first one for the building users, uh, the user questionnaire, one of the things that when you're doing a permanent improvement plan, you need to have a lot more detail about the conditions of the building, including you know, uh, questions like you know, individual teachers in their individual rooms, what's missing that really would, you know, they, they feel they really need to do the most effective teaching. And I know um, teachers have identified in the old part of uh, Mills Lawn, not enough electrical outlets. We know the windows are old and leaky. Um, so we want to hear from uh, all the users of the building, <laughs> sort of in their particular area, sort of a prioritized needs within their room, basically. Um, in your packet, you'll see that we have uh, floor plans, and of course, you who work in the building probably know very well what those floor plans are, but um, that identify the numbers of the rooms, et cetera. And so um, what I'm imagining is a very simple questionnaire that would, be, that would go out to teachers, counselors, special service people, you know, the cafeteria staff, um, to hear about, you know, the things that they feel are missing in that area that, that would really, uh, you know, make the what they do work a lot better and be better for for staff and students. Um, so uh, I was going to at the moment I was thinking leaving it to the users on the committee to kind of think about together. Uh, a simple questionnaire, we don't want it too complicated, to gather that information. Um, and I was thinking of the principles, and now you can tell me this isn't the best way to do it, and if you guys, if, if you who are the users say, you know, this isn't the best way to do it, there's a, there's a better way to do it, um, that's fine, but it's just a question of, if that's the kind of detail that we, that we feel like would be very helpful in terms of the needs of the buildings. The, the principles who, you know, look at the building in a more generalized way, um, maybe you know issues like the the vestibule that uh, you know people are coming into the security needs around that. So I'm thinking that the principals would be kind of uh, developing that prioritized list, and I'm sure a lot of this information is already would not would be at people's fingertips. I'm pretty sure in terms of how it's affecting you, the users. Does that make sense to you, the users? Yeah, we, sorry. Um, we could also really quickly come up with like a Google form to okay. get the teacher's input, and that would be real quick in a spreadsheet as the set of answers. Um, and if anyone needs more to room or time to explain, we could meet one-on-one. -on -one. Um, well, but. and I think our, our Building system experts may want to be meeting with people too who have particular kinds of concerns, so that they can, so that there's, so that we're clear about what the what the need is. Mm -hmm. um, can, can you explain that for me, Judith? I'm sorry. So when you say um, building experts might want to be meeting with people, do you mean the, the users? Possibly. I, I about well, the survey. 
about what, you know, if there's particular, if there's something that's not working. I mean, I was imagining when we get to the, the assignments of the building system experts, for example, I was imagining perhaps um, if we're breaking into teams that um, Scott, who is in IT, you know, was, <coughs> oversaw IT at Centerville Schools, Michael, who is very knowledgeable about IT, might be coming in and speaking to the IT. I, I'm not sure who those people are. You would tell us who they are, who they would want to speak to, to talk to them. Maybe they filled out a questionnaire, and we need to know, okay, so what is your area? What that, are you, that was yeah. my question. Post-survey. Yeah. Post-survey. Post Post yeah. Post I, and, I, and I wanted to ask the same kind of follow-up questions is for designing, because right now we're asking the users to design the questionnaires, right? But for that, that will be up to the users to uh, to work with them to design the questions of that questionnaire, right? And then once that is filled up, then we will share that with the building experts, right? Is that am yeah, I that is right? Yeah. 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 Does that? And then in terms of the principles, kind of seeing the more overarching questions, that they would speak to those issues. Does this make sense? Thanks. So. Hi. I think so. I just, you know, and, I, and I've said this in, in a meeting before, I think, you know, my responsibility is to, you know, support and protect my teachers and their time and, and, and what's important. So if we are going to develop or if I am going to develop this along with Kanetta and, and with Brian and probably Jack, then what I think would be more reasonable is if the experts gave us um, some clear guidelines so that we could just say you know is this a priority in your classroom this 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 all these different components and then allow the teachers to be really specific at the end and maybe on another line because we ask our teachers to do a lot of things our teachers are stretched right now our teachers are preparing for tests they're preparing for the end of the school year um, they just came off COVID they are dedicated they are tired so to ask them to fill out yet another survey or something and it's important and they are going to be you know happy to do it I just want to make it as simple as possible for our teachers that are working so hard educating all the students in the classroom every day how about because I'm sure we'll be working on this collaboratively um, I know in one of these documents you identified these broad areas how about if we focused on those broad areas and then just designed something simple that they could address any issues they had within those areas and then give them opportunity to um, add other things that perhaps weren't addressed in there. If you look yeah. at number one of the uh, of the different systems of the building, correct? That, that's yeah, that's, that's, that's fine. Yeah, I mean right. that's a very good guideline because that's. And I don't want to make it seem like the teachers don't want to do this. No, the teachers no, no, will no, no. definitely want to do this because it they does definitely not want to improve. To, yeah, yeah, I just don't want to, to add be, another thing. It does thing. not need to be complicated. And right. I don't think it, sh it should be. Um, so, um, yeah. Well, I think we got you. But we want to protect your time and we want to make this as efficient as possible. Right. One thing, I'd be interested also if any of them are free to just do a quick walk into their room and just say, Tell me what you like, what you don't like, what you mm -hmm. need. I mean, I don't need a whole lot of detailed information. If, there's, if there are any teachers that would be willing to do that at either school, I'd be, that would give me a little more of one there on top of that. Mm -hmm. okay. Maybe we can get a list of teachers willing to take a little extra time. I was just saying, in terms of some foundational work, and, and on the Google Docs, there was surveys done in 2019. <coughs> And um, the teachers were asked, what works in your school building? How do the buildings help you teach and your students learn? What doesn't work in the buildings? What hinders your ability to teach and the students' ability to learn? Um, and what is the biggest wish for change in the building? That's, that's pretty simple, and that's there, and there's actually a bunch of data already built around that. that right. can, Great. Okay. You can so could we take on. that and give it back to the school reps? Then, well, it's going to be in the depository. It's That's there, yeah. The, yeah, yeah, it's but already in the depository. We'll be separating that out. <coughs> so once you see, you might want to wait to see that and then just build off of that mm -hmm. to keep it very simple. Because we don't want to ask the same questions over again so that have already been answered. I do have a follow-up questions. Uh, Mike, 
Uh, do you know if those uh, questionnaires were filled by room or by buildings? It appears that there was um, seven or eight teachers on a on a uh, maybe a small group that met around the subject at the okay. school in April of 2019. Eli, Brian, Brandon, Jay, Kate, and Rebecca. Okay. So a mixture of science, social studies, chem, band, but like a mixture of folks, and they. It's likely that they were all asked and someone was typing out responses, but this maybe this is something that could go out to more broadly. I don't like so what I what I suggest then is that we look at those and then we use that to build a questionnaire so that you have mm -hmm. you don't have to do that preliminary work. I do think that we need to ask ask to add more specific questions that I that might have come up because of COVID, specifically about air circulation and quality of air. Okay, I'm seeing some people nodding there. But that could help us get started on the first draft of the questionnaires, but you guys don't have to do that first draft. Right. And then the next step would be probably to run it by you and run it by some of the building experts and make sure that we have the right questions, and then, then we would be ready to deploy it. Does that sound right to you? Okay. So you guys are gonna start with this? I'll, I'll take a first jab at it, if that's okay with you. Yeah. Okay. And then I'll send it to you and Jack and uh, the teachers, and then you tell me if I'm missing something else. But and what, where, where do you want the building experts to come in in designing that questionnaire? Or do you just want them well, to look at the... I think, um, I think we still need to get the depository documentation organized, and part of it's going to be about the buildings, you know, specific systems, et cetera, the OFCC report and how you report, for example, having, having information about different systems in the building. But um, we have, but I haven't had a chance to look at what the information has been gathered by the users of the buildings. And like I say, we don't want to reinvent the wheel, make make work where it's already been done, that kind of thing. So till we get that, we want to get that. And I think it's going to all be in the 2022. Maybe it's going to be separated by user information, you know, input versus you know the building. This one is separated by students and teachers. So there are okay. student input from those one high school, student input from those long, teacher okay. input from those long, teacher input from middle, uh, middle school. And that was 2019. Was 2018. that done? 2019. Okay. Yeah, and the was students had a different the, set of task force aspect. Yes. Was that for the task force? Yes. Okay. And the yes. students got a different set of questions, much more simple. What do you like about being in your building? What makes it a good? What makes it good to be at school? Um, what don't you like about your building? What makes it hard to be there? It's just kind of a simpler. Yeah, it was. It questions. was kind of generic. Very, very that broad. One. Okay. Was that I the was, spring of 2019? Yes. The yes, spring. Spring. Yep. So I, I will look at it and then start building questions based on that. But um, just to get uh, the answer to the question is: At what point do you want the building expert to be part in designing that that questionnaire? So once I do a draft. I will send it to Terry and to. I don't know. What do you think, building experts? Do we want? I mean, why don't we look at what we have and then see what's missing? I mean, that to me, um, does that make sense? And maybe as you're looking at the depository, you can be sending Dorothy. Uh, some well, maybe, questions. You know. Or maybe, uh, given that that we have to watch that not everybody is sending stuff to one or the other, but maybe I can be the point person for the building system experts. Okay. Do this point person for the users oh, okay. and then we can talk to each other okay. <laughs> without okay. talking to too many people on the committee. Okay, uh, sounds good. Does that make sense? I have a quick question. Yes. Because of the summer break, yeah. is there a period where a lot of the teachers will not be able to be part of the discussions? Or? Well, the teachers I'll say is um, right the last week of May Friday before mm -hmm. Memorial Day and then they won't be returning until mid-August. Okay. Thank you. So what we want to we want to gather this information before the teachers leave, definitely. Yeah. For comment on surveys, you have to be very, very careful what you put into them because you can really sway them one way or the other, or we could also give the impression that there's a problem. So if you push one one thing or you ask it the wrong way, for instance, heating and cooling. There can be bad heating and cooling, but if you get fifty people in a room you will never get 50 people to agree that the heat's at the right temperature or in the right spot <laughs> or on the right day. So, you know, a lot of it has to be taken very lightly. And I think we should all be very positive 
on the survey. So even if there is maybe a problem somewhere, it should still be a positive survey because, like Mike mentioned, the shoe boxes. Like already, that's a negative swing to the shoe boxes, but they they might be able to repurpose them to really cool small offices where kids could have special learning classes or something with very very low volume of people in there and still be usable at very little money. So I'm, I'm just saying we should all have a positive look and a, and and you know, not not focus on any one item um, at this stage while we're sending out surveys. And I wasn't giving out to you, I mentioned the, the shoe boxes because they are a big issue here in the school. But, you know, like there's a potential there maybe for something else at some stage. Okay, um, so that's that questionnaire. And so, uh, and then uh, Mike had uh, brought up a spatial utilization study. This is not something I had heard about before, but he was uh, telling uh, Dorothy and I. A lot of times schools feel like they are burst, they are bursting at the seams. And if you look at the, if you do a spatialization study um, and you see how the spaces are being used throughout the day, um, you will find you can find well, you can find out whether there's other ways to use the space that actually uh, means that you don't need as much space as you thought you did. So and so he's gonna help us this this is something the users do as well, and he's going to help us make this happen. Yeah, I would just maybe uh, another way to perceive that. So we was involved in the Oakwood renovation, and at Oakwood High School, they, it was a non-starter for them to have swing space. So how do you renovate a building with kids in it? How do you do that without swing space? So a space utilization study helped them realize that they had about six or seven classrooms they could free up in the building and, and, and renovate in six, six or seven classroom phases over a period of time. So really that's a, that's a good use of a space utilization study is, is do we have the space or not? Because if we don't have the space, then we need to plan for modulars and leasing modulars to allow them to do a phase renovation, depending on how deep the renovation is. So I think that's a real, real important piece of the space utilization study is do you have existing space, you know, flex space to renovate with the kids in it or not? And if you do, how much do you have? So do the classrooms become less permanent for one grade then? Do you move people around more during the day? No, usually it's like we'll take seven classrooms. Let's say you take a chunk of this building for, for that way. six weeks. Yeah. And it's offline, and those kids have to go somewhere. So someone's going on the, you know, two of them are going in the gym, and one of them's going on the stage. And where does the, if where does the third, fourth, and fifth one go? So we need to rent modulars to, to take care of that. That's really kind of the um, what would be, I think, really helpful at this stage for a space utilization study. Um, and then I, I, you never know what else comes up from that. Uh, you might find that there are spaces that are underutilized, and some people know that. Wasn't that done for the some form of the park for the 1.0 study? Uh, so, for you mean in the 1.0 version, there was swing space that was part of that plan because we were renovating the high school. Right. So yes, absolutely. So does that need to be done again for the high school? Yeah, I think this plan is going to be. I'm I'm not expecting this to be as the same kind of plan that we had last time, which was to tear down the tower, to tear down the band room, to tear down the shoebox. It was a, that was a deep project, which required swing space. And, and I'm not sure, I don't want to put any pre freaking uh, exceptions, I'm not sure we're going that deep. But you're going to help uh, the users do that? Or you're going to have a form? Or I could, yeah, I, I could help, but really that's probably an administrative task to, just basically it, it's I could give you the form of it's every classroom every period Monday through Friday and a teacher as part of their job says okay second period I, I know what it is yeah, yeah but in answer to David's question the answer is yes people will be moving all the time that's the answer to your question yes there's there's shuffling yeah. and you try to limit it but you got multiple moves if you're doing a, a phase renovation Um, so, 
so I guess the question is, so Terry, you're going to take responsibility for getting that done? Or, <coughs> you know, or should we? No, I, I can. I guess there's questions for me. So how much do you just want the general, how much space is available at every point in the day? How much space is available if we needed to redo X amount of space? Those are two very different things. I think, is it premature to be thinking about a spatialization study? I guess that's it, it's something that could happen in the fall. It could happen later. But I, I would say the answer to that um, would be, like if I have a, a classroom down here, and it's more relevant at the high school, less here, because they're right. self-contained. That's, you're going to have 20 kids in there, be, that one's going to be simple. Yes. But at the high school, uh, take a, a classroom in the tower, how many students are in that class, in that room, every period of every day, Monday through Friday? So we can do Numbers. it. Numbers. It's just, it just becomes a little more complicated because then I have to say, you know, Jack and I have to say, okay, what is the class? And is there an appropriate space for us to put it? For example, physics or chemistry. You know, where else might I put those students? So my understanding was that we were not asking you to find replacement rooms as much as tracking just which, tracking what which classes were occupied at which point over a week. That was my I understanding. I don't need to do it over a week. I mean, I can do it over a day. It's going it's okay. to repeat, right? OK. Um, so a typical day. Yes, uh, I can do that for both buildings. And, and then we'll see, then the next question is what you're raising, right? Is if we need to be, if we're choosing to do some shopping around, then that will be the next step after that. But the first step would be just tracking over, I think you were mentioning over a week, I don't know if, if uh, Terry, if you said that a day would be typical and would um, be repeated, so that, that's fine. I mean, I can give you a week, I think a, a day, I don't know. I would, I would think for the high school, that just looking at the master schedule, we would know who has Right. off period in each room, but as Terry said, you're not bringing chemistry down to the band room, you're not putting yeah, band no, no, in the health room, but it, it would be... But even right oh, now, we can do that right now. Okay. Right. And then when we talk about, and if we yeah. if we decide that, or if we recommend or whatever, we don't make any decisions here, but if we're exploring, we're shuffling around, then we'll have to take into account those special, I don't, I don't know, right. it's, not a, it's not a one-to-one. -one. Yeah. So if when exactly. I do this, I say, hey, there are, you know, eight, eight or ten rooms open during the course of the day. That doesn't mean we can then displace eight or ten classes because then you have to really look at what the purpose is. But yes, we can do it. Okay. All right. Uh, is, we're ready to move on to the building experts assignments. So I was imagining, um, again, if you look at page three of the, of the proposal, which is now part of the committee. Uh, the first, uh, number one of the immediate tasks, talks about the different systems in the building. And so the building system experts, I would like to suggest would work in teams of two, um, and that they would be taking responsibility for um, basically breaking up those different building systems. Now, the OFCC report, the Fanning Howdy report, talks about all the different systems in the buildings, right? And everybody can become more knowledgeable by looking, and I know many of you have already looked at these reports, but looking at them again in a little bit more detail. But say you're going to be, like, I like to start with Scott and Michael, because they have particular expertise in IT. Um, and so I started to think they might work as a team. Um, they've also got knowledge of electrical systems um, that they would take basically responsibility for looking at, at those two areas. Um, that somebody would take, now we, Dorothy, backing up a minute, Dorothy and I talked with uh, Craig Carter, who is our current maintenance superintendent, we had a really good conversation with him. 
Um, he is going to be a great resource. He tells us that Craig Conrad knows us about as much of the buildings as he does, because Craig has been help, has helped from time to time, has has stood in his stead when he's been away. Um, so uh, between the two of them, they know many of the building systems pretty thoroughly in the in both buildings. Um, so. What one thing that all of the building system experts will be needing to do is meeting with Craig Carter. Uh, he does not, we ask him if he'd like to be part of the, you know, not be a member of the committee, but to be coming to the meetings. And he prefers not to, but, but Dorothy and I are going to be letting him know what happens at each of the meetings, so he's totally in the loop. Um, and then the experts, as they're kind of looking at these different system, building systems and kind of their needs, what's working, what's not working very well, kind of their age, when we need to start thinking about either some kind of, you know, thinking about the roof, a replacement versus some kind of um, treatment that can prolong the life of that roof. You know, a couple of the roofs, uh, Craig Carter told us, are still under warranty. Two of them have just come off warranty a couple of years ago. and then. The, so there's six roofs all together. So two, you know, are probably we're looking at needing to replace them sooner rather than later, for example. So you so you'd be gathering that information. Um, so I don't know if you guys want to think about what systems do you want to take responsibility for becoming the most knowledgeable few persons on the committee for, and we can break these systems down amongst the. Does this make sense to do it this way? David's saying yes. You gotta break it down. What is it? You gotta break it down. You gotta break yeah. it down. Yeah. Yep. I'm keeping track. So you say you suggested Scott Five and Mike also other to do what you are, is that good yeah. with you guys? Yeah. And then what other what other you gotta break it down. So. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So technology and electric system, right? Is that uh, how does that sound for you guys? Okay. Okay. I mean if we need to make adjustments. Yeah, we can or, you know, you and for a discussion about something, we should be able to do that. Yeah. Yes, we can you, all guys can all talk, yeah. you guys can all talk to each other, yeah. and that'll keep you in the minority, okay. yeah, so we can do that. Um, all right, next is uh, the exterior envelope with doors, windows, and I was going to throw the roof in as part of the whole exterior of the building. So, who wants to take... Uh, that and then they'll have to take a couple more things as well. <laughs> Come on, this is a fun one. <laughs> David? Okay. <laughs> You're not okay. What else? Is, okay, so you you've got that, you've got the building envelope. Doors, windows, and roofs. Uh, these guys I can are, help David with that. You'll okay. work, work with Great. David. Okay. So it's David and Chris. Okay, plumbing and mechanical. I was going to stick together. And then there's HVAC. I don't know. Should it be lumped together, plumbing, mechanical, and Yeah, HVAC? that's the question. Yeah. Should those be together? For you, for the, I would say. For you guys do. Um, I think you ought to put plumbing and um, HVAC and mechanical together. Okay, that's fine. That makes sense. Yeah. Sorry, can you repeat that? I didn't catch it. Plumbing, mechanical, and HVAC all together. Okay. Fire protection with that, the plumbing, maybe? Well, and then I have fire protection, security, life safety, and ADA. Should, or should fire protection just be with the plumbing and mechanical? No, fire protection is a whole different world. Yeah, okay. Is it? It's really totally different. Okay. And the security system, all of that. Actually, that might nearly fall back on the tech people because that's all computerized and all of those fire got protection. monitoring. Yeah. So security, yeah. life yeah. safety. Yeah. yeah. I mean, right. so much of that anymore is all computerized monitoring stations, electronics. Yeah. Okay. So if I will fall back onto Scott Five and Michael's order if you're up for it, Scott. Mm -hmm. And then if we go back to plumbing and me plumbing mechanical HVAC, do we have two people for that? Jerry? What's that? You want to do uh, plumbing, mechanical, HVAC? Yeah, I'll work on that. Okay. And we should have a second person. Well, we'll put um, Richard on that. Okay. Sure. He's willing to. Okay. <laughs> we'll put Richard on that. Okay. Um, 
And so the fire protection, security, life safety that goes That's with technology and electric system. So then that gives ADA accessibility. Yeah, then we have ADA, we have the, and then we have basically, well, we have ADA, the floors, the interior finishing. I don't know, do those need to be separate things? Well, ADA might go with all of that, wouldn't it? Because your doors have to be the right width, all that sort of stuff. Zero stuff. You have to, be able to get your wheelchair along the flooring. So that should go also with furnishings, right? Because we need to have furnishing that is ADA yeah. compliant. So ADA accessibility, furnishings, floors, and who's taking that? And I think we should put interior finishes too, since it's the uh, outstanding one. Okay. Then the only thing left really is playgrounds, parking, you know, basically the external site. I'll take that. You'll take that, Jerry. Okay. And then Chris, or Chris, Craig, I don't know why I want to call you Chris. Craig um, is going to be floating. It's going to be kind of a resource to everybody. That's kind of what I was thinking. Okay. And then when you guys want to meet with Craig Carter, um, if you're able, if you're able to, you know, connect with Craig, and you can connect with Craig Carter, set up a time and meet with him, so that you can get the more up to date and take a look through the building. Be able to look. That should be okay, correct? That they would be able to come into the buildings and, and go around with Craig Carter, Craig Conrad to look at things they can all. And I go over the small group again just to make sure that I get them right. Mm -hmm. So I have technology and electric system, fire protection, security, life safety. I know that Michael, you volunteer for that, but I think we volunteer here. Are you okay with that? I'm okay with that. Okay. As long as we understand that Michael's the only electrical engineer in the group. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, then the next one would be exterior envelopment, which includes doors, windows, roof. That's David Rush and Chris Hamilton. Then for plumbing, mechanical, and HVAC, have Jerry Papania and Richard Zoff. Then for ADA accessibility, furnishing, floor, interior finishes, we have no one. We haven't filled that specific category. So we need to populate that. Richard Zoff, maybe? <laughs> All right. <laughs> yeah. And big volunteer again. We should probably have a second person. Okay. And then for playgrounds, parking, and site conditions, I got Jerry. Do we need a second person for that, for that category? Well, Jerry's got a huge amount if he's on his own. I know, that's well, why. Richard's going to be with him on, oh, okay. on the plumbing, mechanical, and HVAC. And HVAC, Richard's with him. So I might also add in Richard's Richard. Richard's going to help out on the HVAC, mechanical, and plumbing, is that correct? Yes, that's what I got down. <laughs> but for the playgrounds, parking, and site conditions, so far, this is you only. Do we need to add another person to that? Craig. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> and then, I don't know, does somebody else want to, want to jump on? Well, I'm, I'm kind of all in all of them anyway. You yeah, are trying. Right. Right. I'm happy to help He's wherever I can. Oh, so, can yeah. I add you to yeah, the accessibility yeah. finishing floors and interior finishes? Because yeah. Yeah, I think that's a good idea. Okay. okay. Uh, then we have at least two people per category. Okay. How is energy efficiency going to be handled? Yeah, so we're meeting with Bob Brecca tomorrow morning, um, and we're going to talk with him. Uh, he's offering to be a resource. So I think we should add him then to the HVAC. Okay. Does that make sense? Okay. Okay. And also, I think that it would make sense with the windows, the exterior envelopment, which is David Roche and Chris Hamilton. So it would be a little bit worse. What do you think? Say it again. Uh, Bob's right now. He would feel he, he would fit well with the HVAC group, but also with the exterior envelopment group. Okay. So yeah. I'll I'll add him in both of those. Well, energy efficiency is almost in all of these, right? So electrical, lighting, windows, HVAC, all of that. Yeah. So so far it's going it's to be kind of a layer over all of that. Yeah. I'm suggesting that using the HVAC group and also the exterior envelopment, which would be also the electrical system, but. Um, I think that's already on both. He will carry the most input. That's fine. Yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. So that was for the small groups. 
How do you want to handle hazardous material abatement? Are there just survey, uh, existing surveys and for that that we can use, or does that need to be added to the scope of something? Has any testing been done the last time around, do you know? The only thing I know of is if you look at the, uh, on the drive, the assessment reports, there's, um, there's values associated with the projects for full renovation for, but the, uh, those are 20 to 18 or 19 dollars, you might have those updated, the you know, OSFC assessments. 2020, 2020 costs, costs 20. 2020 costs. Okay. Can you think about those that? Those would be the best. Okay. Can you repeat that, Terry? I didn't catch it. Yes. I, I might ask about the cost sets, the OFCC cost sets. I have 2020 cost sets. I might have 2021. Okay. Um, it should all be in the documents, but again, I'll look. And if there's any document that somebody thinks should be in there, I will look. You know, I didn't own all those documents, so I'm, <laughs> I'm doing the best I can, but yeah. I'll, I'll find everything I can. But I, I know I have the OFCC. I know I have the 2020 cost sets. Does that have the location of all the hazardous materials? There's a, a enhanced environmental assessment report okay. for each building that you could at least read. And maybe, maybe the committee just decides for discussion that that's kind of beyond the scope of, of anyone's expertise. And, and you'll just kind of go with what that report. Okay. So nothing's so. being tested. So for the moment, it really be potentially. Okay. Well, yeah. what, I mean, what are we talking about hazardous materials? I mean, is asbestos? I mean, what else are we talking about? I mean, oh, asbestos yeah. sticks out to me. Are there any big transformers in the building? Probably not. No. Because no. asbestos, we used to have to do a yearly um, inspection. And all that paperwork goes to the main book for each building. Mm -hmm. And uh, as far as I know, that probably still is in effect. So we should have a book telling you where asbestos is or suspected asbestos mm -hmm. is. and where things have been removed and what year and, and all that. So there should be a book for each building, um, for asbestos at least. Are there other materials we can be aware of? I mean, I know there's like drinking, I mean, there was a, a million of them. There's, there's drinking fountain, there's uh, lead, lead in the lead drinking pen. water. Yeah. Um, so we have to make sure that you know, your, your water coolers are a certain kind and it can't be made before such and such a year because then they could possibly contain lead. Um, but I assume you don't have this. Well, we, you know, as we replace drinking fountains, we always upgrade, of course, to ones that are approved. Uh, so how do we know which ones haven't been replaced yet? Well, I'd say by now they probably all have been. Okay, um, how can we check that and make sure that um, we can check we just have to look at them we have to look at, them. <laughs> we have to look at each individual one so that would fall under the plumbing mechanical hvac right but probably yeah okay are there other things we need to think about exterior gals uh, galvestus panels fire doors tank insulation pipe insulation code base mastic chalkboard mastic sheet flooring and mastic window and door caulking Sink undercoating, fume hoods, boiler components, lab countertops. That's just in the, in the report. It's a long list of things. What's, what's the name of that document? Uh, this is the OFCC assessment report. There was a, it says here, a Dayton environmental testing, uh, January 2017, did a what they call an AHERA, H-E-A-R-A. -E it's a three-year re-inspection report. Um, so there would be some, that report would be somewhere in facilities. Maybe Craig, Craig has that and can pull that. And, um, and then, de de depending on how deep the renovation goes and how much stuff you're touching, that'll become a factor. Okay. Well, we tried to manage as much asbestos in place as we could, because the less you mess with it, the less, mm -hmm. you know, everybody at originally like wanted to deal with it. Right, you don't have to deal with it, and it just costs you a lot of money, and I've got stories about that. So, just roughly, if we look over the floor plans here, that will be, you know, if we look at Neil's loan, that will be in the older part of it, I assume. Should be. Yeah. 
should be the non 2002 revisions right. of the bill. Yes. Okay. And um, is now a good time to talk about uh, those? Okay. Um, so, in the packet that you have, you have floor plans of the schools, and we are not going to make those available digitally. They only are copies. Uh -huh. We would want them to not be circulated, um, just for basic security of the school. So this is something for you to safeguard and um, keep for the work of the scope of this committee in this room. And then asbestos at the high school, is that also something that? Uh, yes, okay. we have a report for both buildings. Mm -hmm. Okay. And probably for the, the board office also. Okay. And we don't have, actually that's something that we never discussed, we didn't include the offices. We don't, we don't own that. We don't own that. We're struggling right now. We, we don't have enough room. <laughs> the basement floods. We don't have enough storage. Um, Is that the villages? Yes. Okay. And so we're trying to figure out if we can kind of I can't even believe I'm saying this. Subdivide the space in there. I, I said I'll split my office. Um, the basement is not the best place to be. Yeah. Um, I, you know, if I have employees with health issues, and I do, yeah. I, it, it's, I can't keep them there. So it's a real struggle. But that is not a facility that we own. Um, but is that a question? Is, is relocating the offices, should that be falling under the purview of this committee to look at whether or not we, you don't think so? There's no, well, that's, that would have to be, you know, there are ways for us to get office space if we want to pay for it. For yeah. example, Rebecca's new space is beautiful. I just toured it Friday. They have a boatload of office space. Yeah. I can't justify, I mean, I might have to, I might be forced to, but we get that for, what, a dollar a year, we pay utilities and we may maintain it. Um, so I would prefer this process be focused on my students and my teachers and, and their needs. Okay. We will make it, we will figure it out, um, but, but these needs are, are real. So, any other comments? I think we're kind of done. Are, how do people, how are people feeling about these assignments? <laughs> and are they good with, do they know what they're doing when you go home, you're, we're gonna let you know early next week, we've got the depository kind of in some kind of order so you can find and sort of review those documents. I think I would do that first, especially in the area that you are now taking responsibility to look at. Now, we're talking about fairly soon, uh, hiring a maintenance plan advisor. So they're going, they are, they're engineers, I understand. They would be, they would be doing all this work. Also. And they're gonna be looking yeah. at this stuff as well. But we're gonna be um, able to be a resource to them, um, point them to where the information is. Um, one thing I was thinking is, um, especially for the building systems experts at the next meeting, that you bring a written document of what you've figured out thus far that you, you know, put it in writing and get it out to the committee maybe a few days before the meeting so that that information can be shared so we can have a better sense of, kind of where we're at. Judith, I can share some information about the maintenance plan advisor. Okay. So I just got the paperwork back from um, our legal counsel. Um, so this will be posted by next Tuesday. Um, there's a pre-proposal meeting on April 21st at noon, and uh, all submissions are due by May 3rd at 2 p.m. Okay. Um, have you, has Mike had an opportunity to kind of look at that? We talked about maybe all this, uh, just making sure that it's uh, written in the way that we and I think specifically what, what you were, what uh, we wanted to make sure is that they were materials that were requested of the applicants that would give us enough to do. Um, well, we paid our attorneys to do it. Yeah. So yeah. I'm, I'm going to, I mean, I'm happy to share it with Mike, but um, 
it's, a, it's, I mean, Mike had mentioned that, you know, there are some things we need to make sure they understand in order for us to get what it is that we want. And I just want to make sure that that happens so that we're. And we, we get, I think we, we mentioned that list to you, Terry, last time we talked about it. Right. So then and no and surprises there. Yeah. And, um, yes. Okay. I meant this mic. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Uh, we're going to look at uh, photovoltaics for to supplement the electrical energy. I don't know. <laughs> That's what we're going to figure out, I guess. We've got a lot of land out there, and there's a lot of roof space uh, where photovoltaics could uh, lessen the energy bill. I didn't know whether that wouldn't be under consideration uh, well, or not. I mean, I think um, talking with Bob and as we get more information about the building so we know what exactly we're dealing with in terms of, you know, the maintenance needs of the building, we're going to start to get a, you know, then we can start thinking about that kind of an issue. But I think we need to kind of figure out where we're at first. I mean, initial payback is very slow still. So on the solar panels, even with the new solar panels? Well, there there are, uh, I don't know if it still exists, but there was a program that I was unaware of with the state that you can do energy efficiency improvements. And the way I understand it is the state, and Mike probably knows about this, and I might be off base on it, the state essentially loans you the money to do that and you pay the state back with the energy savings. We, we had that when I was here. Is that right? Yeah. What, what kind of program? Well, it, to me it was kind of sketchy because uh, they were replacing some windows and doors and things like that along with, I, I can't, I can't remember, but I know there was some stuff in there that they threw in that we needed because we could pay it back with our energy savings and I don't know how that ever worked out for how was much we saved. Was uh, that in 2000? Was that? Was uh, that I could not tell you. It was the well, program has been in existence since 1985. Yeah, it's, it was well, it was a long time ago because it have been gone for 10 years and it was well before that that we did this. Uh, I don't know if we if Craig would have any paperwork still on it try to find out and see if there's anything. I mean, if you want to, I mean, we can talk to um, Bob and see what he knows or could, or else somebody's just going to have to look into this program, see if it's, it's see a if thing. It's still a, see if it's, it's a thing, see how it works, and see if it's something we want to be thinking about. Okay. Judith, have we talked about timelines at all? Like, you, it sounds like you want us to be all done in a month. <laughs> um, I, I, I guess I, I'm, I think at the, the school board meeting where this was passed, there was a discussion about coming up with a timeline for, for activities, and I, I guess I haven't seen it yet, so is that something we want to discuss? Let's talk about it. Yeah. Okay. So what do people think? How? Uh, so, like I say, a maintenance plan advisor is going to be ultimately helping us. We're going to try to become uh, a resource to them. Um, be working with them but um, so if we're talking about May something as the what was that date? it's just a three-week timeline yeah so May 3rd okay. so it goes out on the 12th mm -hmm. um, the 21st is a pre-proposal meeting for them to come and see and then uh, responses are due by May 3rd at 2 p.m. So I know, David, you had an opinion about, you told me this. I was feeling we're better off to at least get a good amount of information relatively quickly, you know, not let it drag on into the fall. You know, be like six or eight weeks, just, you know, chop chop. And maybe we don't have everything, but at least we've got something coming together and everyone starts to understand what the other guy's finding, because so much of this all crisscrosses back together anyway. I mean, and, and, if, and if we don't just put a short timeline, you just, you're, you're just yeah. not pushed to get there. Can I jump in on that? Yeah. Okay. 
sorry, I'm trying to take notes as I'm listening and as I'm thinking about this, I'm feeling a little stretched right now. But um, the idea that we had here is that this group would be gathering as much of the information that we've outlined right now over the next two to three months before the teachers. We want to get the teachers and the staff's input before they go out on break. The building experts will be working through this over the summer. Uh, and then, then we'll get to the, to the point where we'll cross the information and make sure that whatever solutions you're exploring are suitable to the administrators and the teachers and uh, the staff uh, so that we can outline several uh, solutions. And at that point, I think this is where the MPA would come in and say, this is what we recommend. This is the order in which we recommend to go for. The idea of our goal is to have um, a PIP outline with the cost and the priorities by late fall 2022. So now it is a tight schedule, but we're going to push for it. I mean, some of this won't take that long to gather, I don't yeah. think. The, the conditions of the roofs, um, when we talked to Craig Carter, you know, he said the folks who take care of our roofs, and I know Craig had said we should get uh, borings, is that what, what do you call yeah, it? Um, yeah, core samples. Core samples, okay. So, you know, Craig told us two of them are under warranty, two of them have come out of warranty maybe two years ago, and we need, we need to check the dates and all of that, and two of them, you know, are we're looking towards replacement. So, um, the, you know, so, if we get those core samples, we almost know where our rooms are. I mean, am I right? Is, yes. there, more to, is there more to know? No, <laughs> it's, that's, well, that will tell you whether your uh, roof is restorable right. or whether it's not restorable and you have to replace it. Right, and the restore, and then we can look for, we can find those costs. So it seems like that's an example, and roofs are kind of straightforward. <laughs> but uh, So in other systems are not so straightforward, but so uh, we shouldn't make it too complicated, I think. Um, and I think, like I say, Craig and Craig are going to be a huge resource yeah. um, in terms of knowledge of our systems as they are. If we know that kind of information about all these systems of the building, using the roof as an example, the roofs as an example, um, you know, knowing kind of where things stand right now, um, that's going to be a, a good piece of information that helps us to know, you know, what we're really looking at in terms of maintain the maintenance that needs to happen in the current buildings. You recall this? You know. That you sent to me? Yeah. yeah. I, I don't know if you want people to look at that or comment on it or, you know, whether they feel um, it's, there's things missing, they want to modify the. I looked at it, but to tell the truth, I didn't quite. Why don't we look at it after this meeting and okay. then we, we can send it out to people? think you can hammer your piece out in a couple of months is what you're saying? Yeah, that's I what I'm think saying. So. I mean, yeah. Yeah. roof and exterior is not going to be. Yeah, okay. I mean, maybe that's the easiest thing, so I'm looking at the wrong <laughs> the wrong thing. as a. But I mean, as a person who does uh, inspections and you're looking at all these different systems yeah. and trying to understand their needs. Well, maybe Chris and I can get it knocked out and then go and help right. someone else. That's kind of what I was yeah. thinking. You know, if you yeah. there's some props through yeah. linkage to it. Okay. Is, is wrong with it. Okay, I think we should maybe think about it. Any last thoughts? Yeah. Okay. Then I will let you adjourn it. Okay.